today's reading is a highly edited by me uh, condensation of the, an article about thought capitalism couldn't get any worse, meet the workplace spiritual consultants by Jessa Crispin, which appeared in The Guardian recently. And it says, employers have figured out how to exploit society's crisis of meaning by turning workplaces into sites of cult-like religious devotion. A robust selection of freelance consultants to help corporations imbue the office space with, quote, meaning that people used to derive from churches, temples, mosques, and the like. Employers can make the workday a kind of spiritual practice. And to these consultancy organizations, I only want to say one thing. Congratulations, you just invented the cult. <laughs> Our jobs are not supposed to bring us enlightenment. We should acknowledge the meaninglessness and withhold our devotion. Let us not feel grateful for our exploitation and let us not try to invite God into our Zoom call. Our spirits need tending, yes, but that is a task for when we are off the clock and we will never be off the clock if we hand our souls over to our bosses. <laughs> If we have to play a spiritual role in front of our boss, let it be that of the heretic. That's it. Wow, Albert. Thank you. That was very well done. Thank you so much. Okay, so today, rather than a speaker, we'll be discussing an article written by David Brooks from the October 5th issue of The Atlantic entitled, America is Having a Moral Convulsion kind of as a brief summary uh, of this article, uh, for those that I'm learning that David Brooks is a conservative and uh, he, he uses uh, Samuel Huntington's idea that every 60 years we go through a, uh, a revolution uh, in our country, a moral revolution. And he uh, cites the American revolution, uh, the Jacksonian times, which were in like the, uh, the 20s, the 1820s. Um, he missed along the way the Great Depression and the Civil War. He didn't, he didn't mention those as part of the Great Convulsion, but he does look at the 60s and then um, uh, the, 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 uh, there was a, um, a prediction that uh, there would be a revolution, another convulsion um, in the second or th uh, third um, decades of, the, uh, of this century of, uh, of the the 2000s. Could you, uh, would you please get started, Albert? Okay. Um, yeah, to, to kind of frame the article, I want to just look at some things that are right at the beginning and right at the end first to kind of to show you where, where, where Brooks starts and where he winds up. Uh, you know, he talks about moral convulsions, says they happen every 60 years and all, and we can argue about whether that could possibly be true or not or you know, what it means, you know, about whether these convulsions actually happen. But he, you know, he, he, he cites Samuel Huntington, who was a, a fairly respected uh, professor. I think he was at Harvard and he was, a, he's been a foreign, he did foreign policy consulting to some administrations. I think there were democratic administrations. Uh, he died in 2008. Uh, but uh, Brooks doesn't mention that Huntington Huntington's book, most recent, relate, one of his later books that drew a lot of uh, attention was one called The Clash of Cultures, where he was not even, uh, he was not talking about the upcoming uh, uh, moral convulsion that we were going to go through. He was talking about a clash of cultures between America and, it's not clear from the, the little summaries I've seen of it, uh, and whom, but he, um, he, he predicted um, the, the, uh, that America should require immigrants to adopt English and rely on Protestant religions to save itself against the threats of immigrants. So that sounds kind of like there's a little xenophobia in there. And, you know, 
Brooks brings up this, these moral convulsions and ponders their various causes and effects. But I kind of think that uh, he, he may have not, not kind of dwelt enough on the xenophobic aspects of it. You know, the, if you want to, if you want to uh, try to find an origin of the current convulsion, you might go to the founding of the Tea Party or the, instant, the impetus for the Tea Party first appeared in February of 2009, which was less than a month after we inaugurated our first black progressive president. That it, you know, it was just a big change who, who Trump had portrayed as a foreigner or, or, or a great number of, of, uh, of, of Americans had tried to present as a foreigner in order to make him evil so that he couldn't, he, he couldn't be a, an appropriate president. Uh, so the xenophobia thing maybe is, is, is underrated there and it, it could really be a xenophobic kind of a, of a moral convulsion we're having, if anything. Uh, now I'll skip to the end uh, of, of what Brooks comes to. You know, he says, we're having a moral convulsion, everything's changed and it's a new world, it's the age of precarity, all, everything's gonna be different, power's gonna be realigned, da, 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 da. And he says, our only plausible future is decentralized pluralism. Now, decentralized pluralism means, oh, we have regional autonomy, like they're doing in the United Kingdom, where Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are semi-autonomous, uh, separated from England and uh, various other places in Europe are, are, are going that way, etc. But to me, this means that what Brooks is saying, and Brooks being a conservative, well, the conservative image of the world has failed, you know, between the epidemic, failure to deal with the pandemic, the, the failure to, to do anything about the increasing stratification of wealth, failing to do anything about uh, racial equality, failing to, uh, failing to do anything about uh, 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 promoting democracy, et cetera, having these t terrible uh, depressions and, and, and economic problems, very high unemployment, all that. Conservative world is gone. Let's split the country and then get all the regions into the same race to the bottom that we previously have imposed on the country. And let's make the let's force the the liberal regions to do what the conservatives do, which is to give uh, wealth all the advantages so that they'll invest to try to save one, make one region get ahead of the other, and squeeze the working man again in favor of the of the of the wealthy, so that low priced goods can be produced and be plentiful for the, peop the few people who have money. So it looks to me like th that, you know, this is basically a conservative uh, admission that, that, well, everything I believe in isn't working. So uh, it must be game over. We got to find a new game to play. Okay, Albert, thank you. That was a, a really lovely a beginning here. Uh, but I'm going to start off, Carl had a, <laughs> Carl had a comment. Yeah, I actually, I mean, it's, you know, some of, uh, uh, some of uh, Al's comments and stuff were, I just wanted to agree with him. Okay, thank you. The, uh, you know, when, what I, uh, when I was reading it, he's talking about uh, the 1950s is this really stable time. And uh, he reported it as, uh, this is B. Brooks. The family was stable. There was widespread prosperity. Um, there was cultural co uh, coercion, co uh, cohesiveness, the cultural cohesiveness, um, a political, social, moral order. And uh, I thought, well, yeah, if you're white and male, but uh, it wasn't that way for um, my mom. You know, she, you know, she didn't have many options. Uh, it wasn't that way for anyone of color. Uh, and it just, um, his premise that this was, you know, it was such a wonderful time in the 50s. And so this moral culture, uh, he talked a lot about trust and um, trust in government and that he felt that there was, before 1964, there was, uh, there was trust in our government. And then uh, 
but when this trust left, um, people began to feel that they were invisible, they were not valued, um, they were, uh, they, they, there was a loss in faith in experts, there was a loss in faith in information. Uh, and I, I mean, when I listened to the Black Lives Matter, um, and they're, they're, that they, you know, that we, we they, people felt as if they were invisible, that they were not valued. And therefore the, the mantra Black Lives Matter isn't to say that Black Lives Matter more or other people's lives don't matter. It's just that we matter too, you know? And, uh, and so I, I really felt um, uh, that his, his, uh, he was looking at a time through his, uh, you know, his, his perspective, Brooks's perspective, that wasn't everyone's perspective for sure in America. Yeah, Brooks talk about, talks about decentralized pluralism, but I think we have to consider both what is called the centralized one and the local one. Now, we know that over the years, the centralized, more and more things have been centralized. The federal government, for example, has assumed more and more powers intruding into the life. By the same time, we know that in at least in the present administration, it is important and essential, this thing, this lacking. It is not happening. So actually the need is a coexistence of the centralized one as well as the decentralized local affairs. But one has to be very clear where we want the centralized one or where it should be. At the same time, what can be left to the local one without interference from the central authority. Now, for example, at the very local level, like city level and so on, it's very important that a lot of the local issues can be solved without any real guidance from the higher central or even state levels. But for that to happen, you know, we need the engagement of the people in that locality. But in recent years, you know, this uh, dearth and death of local newspapers is actually acting against that one. It's so things are getting centralized, not from the central government, but the so-called social media is sort of feeding in. And then you are not able to get, you know, the required information for your local uh, city or town or uh, municipality what you need and what you can say about it, how you can influence the decisions and so on, because more than 50% of the decisions are probably people affected by the local mm -hmm. uh, decisions. So we need this combination of both these things, but we have to be clear where we draw the line and how we do it. Thank you, Rega. that was very well said. Thank you. We've got a comment from Kathy Humble. Uh, anytime you're looking at someone's proposals or arguments, it's important to be sure that their underlying uh, data is accurate and that their interpretations of it are accurate. Mm -hmm. And I had some problems with this reading because, for example, he says, I see no scenario in which we return to being the nation we were in 1965 with a cohesive national ethos, a clear national establishment, trusted central institutions. I turned 21 in 1965. That was not the United States in 1965. It may have been half of the United States, but we certainly had a major culture and then a counterculture that was quite vibrant and quite uh, noisy. Uh, he talks about the 50s and the, the security of the 50s. And he, he measures it in terms of, um, he says, now we have... Americans today experience more instability than at any period in recent memory. Fewer children growing up in married two-parent households, more single-parent households, more depression, higher suicide rates. The 50s, which, is, which are praised in other parts of the, the piece, there may have been fewer divorces. Children may have technically lived in households with two parents, but the two parents may have been fighting like cats and dogs. It was it's so much easier to get a divorce now than it was then. It was, it was a very different situation. Um, single parent households 
it was uh, early on impossible to get an abortion. Uh, if you got pregnant, you were sent off to uh, Aunt Matilda's for nine months and, and came back uh, and nobody talked about it. Right. So there, there wasn't the ease with which women can socially raise a child on their own uh, these days. There, that didn't exist in the 1950s. And um, I don't see that atmosphere as automatically producing security. It can produce a lot of other kinds of insecurities. So I argue with a lot of his basic premises. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. That was very well put. And thanks for finding those quotes. That really helps. Carl, you have a, you have a comment now. <laughs> yeah, I um, <clears throat> a couple things. One is that um, Brooks labeled this thing America's having a moral crisis, and I, I kind of wonder if that isn't a huge projection. I mean, he's gone through a lot of stuff recently in his personal life. He had a divorce. He married one of his colleagues. I mean, <laughs> and uh, and he, he seems to, and not just that, but some of the some of the other kinds of things he's been writing about and so forth really indicate that he's you know, that that there are some uh, personal issues going on here. Um, and he's also been criticized, you know, along with, with what Kathy said, he's also been criticized for, um, for you know, taking his principles and his, or his uh, theories and then shoehorning the evidence into it in some way, shape or form. Um, so that's the other thing. And then if anybody, I used to subscribe to The Baffler for a while until I was just, you know, I, I started to cut subscriptions because I can't read all this stuff, but, but The Baffler used to sell uh, David Brooks toilet paper. <laughs> you know, and 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 I th I think it was because of his um, his his quote liberal stance, which is sort of uh, sort of a kind of a um, mask for his white privilege. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, that's those are my comments. So thank you, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Dave, uh, David Beam has a comment. Uh, my comment's just about your comment about talking about the 1950s and the comments of that. It's just like, I, I read the article two, three weeks ago, so I don't, yeah. I don't necessarily remember it right. But, but yeah, I would agree certainly with the concept of what you were saying. Yeah, if, you, if you're white, yeah, it was a great time. And in that sense, maybe not, at least economically, if you weren't white, you know. But the, the main point of that is that was such an aberration of history, the 50s, because the World War II had destroyed everything. We were the only power of any kind during that decade at all. You know, all of Europe was destroyed. Russia was destroyed. Japan was destroyed. All our current competitors right. were all destroyed. So we were the only, especially just, just specifically economic. China was, China was nothing. It was a backwater. And so, yeah, it was easy to life. I mean, our economy was booming because we were the only game in town. Mm -hmm. And so it was really easy to have a great, you know, stable life. Everybody had what they needed. Everybody, meaning white people, mm -hmm. uh, they all had more, uh, an abundance of material things and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, you know, if you don't put that in the equation, it's kind of a, <laughs> to me, as a bizarre comment in a lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm. Anyways, that's my comment. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, it was a, it was a unique time. I mean, yeah. We had we were never bombed. I mean, we I guess it was it wasn't uh, quite that unique. Yeah. Well, hang on. You can put your name in. Then. Put my name in. I'm going to put. You, hang on. I got to put your <laughs> name in here. <laughs> and again, I'm speaking from a materialistic standpoint. Yes. Yeah. The moral parts and all that. Okay. And stuff, but yeah. So. Dave, D Dave Danucci, did you want to make make a comment about what you said, or should I read this? Um, I, I, I think I kind of just said what I, yeah, I accidentally sent it to you instead of the group. I see. Um, it, uh, yeah, it, I, when I saw the article, I just saw him asking for the kinds of, uh, sufficient trust in our society that we could get by again. I mean, right now, so much of the trust has gone away and he seemed to be looking for ways to get that back again and looking to whether we should be looking more to local neighborhoods or, or communities or tribes. Uh, he mentioned the pros and cons of a tribal approach where, you know, if the tribes can't talk to each other, you still have problems, even if you have support from your tribe. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it resonated 
I, I'll just say it resonated a lot with me. And yes, I do see a lot of the simplifications that other people are highlighting, but I think in general, he was pleading for many of the things we're all pleading for right now, which is uh, maybe some leadership that tries to pull us together instead of push us apart and, try, and tries to form some kind of a basic uh, understanding and society that allows us to re rely more on each other than than just constantly pushing away from each other. I guess. Thank you, dear. There was a, a I like that counterpoint. Uh -huh. jo uh, Joyce, you uh, you don't see it the same way Elle does. Would you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, I think David just did in a way. I mean, David <laughs> sort of picked up on my point that yeah. um, that groups with more trust, groups can get along a whole. The whole second half of the article seems to me a bit plea for trust, and mm -hmm. I want to talk about a little more about that later. But um, the the other part of that was, I mean, the example of Houston was what he was trying to get at, and he didn't go very far with that. Mm -hmm. um, but I also wanted to say that Brooks does argue that we need moral certainty, and I'm not sure that's what we need out of trust. I don't know how far you can go with that, and Ring is going to talk about that a little bit later too. Do we all have to believe the same moral, have the same set of moral values? To some extent, maybe yes, but um, you can take that you can take that too far. And I just wanted to comment quickly too on um, the video that we have will bear out Carl's opinion on Brooks's uh, being influenced here by a lot of personal problems. Um, I think that will come out in the uh, in the video that we have. And um, the last thing I wanted to say, these are all just short comments, but. Um, mm -hmm. The 50s led us to the 60s. And I think part of that was the, was things like blacks being redlined and people just not having the opportunities to be who they were. Um, that, that developed even more further in the later, in later, later decades when gays demanded their own rights and their own perspectives. And so um, I'm rattling here, but I wanted to respond to all those different um, ideas. No, thank you, Joyce. Thank you very much. Um, Ringa, you had an, another comment. You're next to I very much doubt whether it's possible to have some sort of a common <coughs> morality. <coughs> now, the best we can do is some sort of, a, you know, essence of the thing which can people can agree, you know, a small thing. But quite a lot finally going to depend, as uh, Dave said, on the leadership because, for example, we talked about trust. Now, to create the trust, actually, it has to be a major part has to be played by the leadership. Of course, you can try to push the leadership toward a certain extent, but leadership still plays a big role in actually creating a, creating a certain point of view or you know, sowing dissension like what is happening now. So that's just what is more important. So I'm not very sure that we can have some easily have a common moral values which everybody can follow. Uh, Hank, Rob, you had a uh, would like to join the conversation. Yes, I uh, I think that the the moral crisis is with the Republican Party itself, and that is the recognition that Donald Trump is the eventual end of the policies that they've been pushing for 60 years. There are a number of books by Republican strategists now saying, um, we have been conning and lying and uh, pulling the wool over people's eyes for our entire professional career. Um, so I think, I think the, 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 the trouble now is facing up for Republicans to what has actually been going on um, at, at least since uh, Reagan. Jill Gear, you wanted to make a comment about uh, the millennials and the Gen Xers. Yeah, I did like his portrayal of of the fear that they have been basically born into and how it has shaped their collective consciousness. And, you know, I've been talking to some friends having, having been in higher education for over 20 years and seeing um, 
and having children of my own, just just seeing this these two generations and what they've had to do to sort of overcome and create their own reality. And you know what I've been saying to friends now who want to vote for Republican because you know we have to preserve you know democracy and you're going to be a socialist. And I keep saying to them, you know, this is not our time. We had our time, and what we need to do is figure out how to help these next generations right. get to where they want to be because it is going to be their country. Right. Jill, that was lovely. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Al, you're next. Oh, yes. Uh, when you said that the 50s were unique, actually, there were two, there were two cycles that, that two things that happened, namely the two world wars. The first world war, everybody borrowed money from America. And then after the war, they had to pay it back. That's when Fort Knox filled up with gold. Before that, we didn't have so much gold, but we had almost all the world's gold after World War I. And then World War II, at the climax of World War II, the United States did have 50% of the world's industrial capacity sort of the, that was in existence at that time. So it was also you know, a, very, a, a, a very unusual and prosperous period uh, for our country. But uh, yeah, I agree with Brooks about trust. I trust is the most wonderful thing. But uh, you look into, well, where did trust go? He quotes 1964 as having a very high, high level of trust in government. Uh, people who have looked at where did trust go? Well, what happened after 1964? All the people who we're getting educated under the National Defense Education Act, big funding of education by the federal government starting in the late 1950s, started, started being able to vote and to be surveyed in the, counted in the surveys and trust plummeted because people were smarter, for goodness sake. It's not that people were trustworthy in, in 1964 more than they are now or in the 1950s more than they are now. It's that people, you know, it was just, less intelligence, less, less, um, less uh, critical thinking. But what this gets us to is um, the mass production society. It's very hard in a mass produced society to, uh, have, to have the little man feel like he's being represented, particularly when you have a mass produced culture we copy free enterprise. Free enterprise is a dictatorial system within every corporation, total top down, total central committee. That's what we have, that's what everybody's living under. Uh, Willie, you have a comment. Okay. You said in the 50s, your mom didn't have it so great. I think all the men in this group heard you say that. Then two different men in their comments said in the 50s it was great if you were white so don't men hear us when we say we didn't have it good in the 50s don't you men know hear that you need to say it was great in the 50s if you were a white male you need to say it you need to ask your question that way no i i just i sent the article to Dale. Oh, sorry okay but oh, it was you huge. probably had no way of knowing that. Yeah. In, in his article, it says in the central focus, uh, social trust. Social trust is a measure of the moral quality of a society uh, of whether the people and institutions in it are trustworthy, whether they keep their promises and work for the common good. When people in a church lose faith in or trust in God, the church collapses. When people in a society lose faith or trust in their institutions and in each other, the nation collapses. Well, I think we've had a, a real good example of losing faith in our president because he's told all kinds of lies and crap like that. So I think he is really leading us down the wrong trail. So I think he, he, he's, he's just helping us. He's helping the nation collapse, so to speak. Uh, Dale Humble, you had a comment. Yes, uh, about trust. It yeah. seems to me that uh, every day we get scores of examples of why we should not trust. We get all those phone calls that are trying to scam us. <laughs> yes. we get all those emails that are trying to scam us. Mm -hmm. 
that I think on a daily drip, drip, drip of you can't trust people is bad for the overall trust. Mm -hmm. We should do something about that. We should institute a, a nickel charge on every call that's completed that uh, either goes to the phone company for offering free phone service or goes uh, to provide internet net access or something. And, and we need to do more about, the, about spam. Anyway, I think that contributes to people's sense that they cannot trust people. Yeah. And it's, it's a few predators, but it hits yeah. everybody in large volume. That's it. Those calls come in every day, a couple every day. You're absolutely right. And they come every day. Uh, Hank, Rob, you had another comment. Uh, three quick things. I, I think the point about uh, moral agreement is something like, if we're going to cooperate, we have to agree that lying is out. Yeah. And uh, you can have other kinds of issues, but we have to come to some agreement like that. We have to um, uh, have some agreement that pretending certain things are true when they aren't, that's, we, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, if that is what he's driving at, then I can certainly agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, second of all, it, as far as I can recall or know, the part of the upheaval in the 60s was this counterculture of young white people. Yeah. And which was, we don't want to make a good wage from IBM and wear a blue suit and a white shirt for the rest of our lives. That's not the life we want to live. And, and we don't care how much money we can make. We just don't want to live like that. And thirdly, the, the problem as far as I can see with the 60s in trust is the entire war in Vietnam was built on a lie. Yes. Namely, that there was some kind of an attack on U.S. forces in the Gulf of Tonkin. Mm -hmm. now, and if anyone has been able to find anything that explains why Johnson went with this lie, because he knew it was a lie, he knew it wasn't true. Mm -hmm. For some reason, the Democratic administration wanted to have a war. Mm -hmm. and, and from then on, belief in the federal government was in serious trouble. Yeah. Oh, okay, so one was to Hank Rob's earlier comment. Um, now I've lost it, it goes back. Yeah, it says some pundits look back to the post Eisenhower era, uh, Barry, uh, Barry Goldwater, as the beginning of the changes in the Republican Party. Yeah, even before the Reagan era. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, then another comment, to Jill uh, regarding her friends who would consider voting Trump. I don't even know anybody who would consider voting for Trump. Oh, wait, my sister. Uh, I, I don't discuss it with her. The, um, I see a far greater risk of loss of uh, the democratic government if voting for Trump because I, I he's, he's moving in such a so toward totalitarianism and and if he wins this election there he'll have no guardrails to keep him from moving in the very direction he's been moving mm -hmm. uh, i then started to write a note saying i remember i think this goes back to the last comments from hank i remember in the i grew up in the 50s and was under the impression that government and those who worked in government were all wise and um, um, benevolent. Mm -hmm. But I remember thinking in 1970, in the midst of the um, of Watergate, a, a loss of innocence. Yeah. Though the years of the 60s had been for me, I, in every sense of the word, in many senses of the word, and but is the trust in government between the Vietnam era, which actually began with JFK, not just 
It's just that um, LBJ expanded on it. And um, and the Watergate era, that by the time I'd gone through those two events, I I had a complete loss in trust in government. Thank you, Susan. That, you know, there's so many things of that loss of innocence. What a well -placed. the loss of innocence, and then of course all the other loss of innocence that comes with in early twenties. Thank you. Yes, early twenties. Thank you, Jeff. You, <laughs> Jeff, you're you're having a convulsion of your own. Go ahead and uh, <laughs> punch in here. That was funny. Your comment is funny in the chat. He writes, uh, when thinking of Donald Trump, I have a moral convulsion. <laughs> yes. uh, Joyce has a few, has, has another comment. Um, you know, and I, as I said in the chat, maybe this is my leftist bias. Mm -hmm. um, I liked a lot about what Brooks had to say, but there were, whenever he started to talk about the right and the left, I got lost and I appreciated his comments about the right and its failings, but I couldn't understand what he was saying about the left. And in the first example is he says on the left, distrust of institutional authority has manifested as a series of checks on power that have given many small actors the power to stop common plans, producing what Fukuyama calls a vetocracy Power to the people has meant no power to do anything, and the result is a national nimbyism that blocks social innovation in case after case. I'm not gonna go on to the second one because that's, if anybody can explain that to me, I'd love to know what he's talking about. Joyce, why don't you read it again? That just so people can hear it. Yeah, distrust of institutional authority has manifested as a series of checks on power that have given many small actors the power to stop common plans, producing what uh, uh, something called a veto, a veto, I'm sorry, vetocracy, veto, I need to break that word apart. Yeah, vetocracy, okay. Power to the people has meant no power to do anything. And the result is a national NIMBY, not in my backyardism, that blocks social innovation in case after case. What is he talking about? I see McConnell is the one who's doing the blocking. I mean, right. I'm lost there. Right. Thank you. I'll take that one on a little bit. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> that's what I was kind of talking about with the shoehorn, is that he develops this, this uh, he has this idea. It's the left's fault, you know, for this, this uh, gridlock we're in or whatever, because you know, not in my backyard. And then he then he develops this, and he throws in a couple of names, uh, you know, as as the reason for this this pre existing condition he has that is anti leftist. Um, so that's what I that's what I think that his the, the criticism around his shoehorning comes into that. If you look underneath what he's saying, it's basically he's just saying the left. It's the left's fault for this dilemma that we're in because of, the, and then he can then he can look into the past and cherry pick stuff for one thing, and then he can he can he can bring in some authority figure um, uh, to bolster his, his position. So that's that's what I think is going on here. So. Okay. Thank you, Carol. Um, Sharon Joy. Yeah, has a mine is pretty complicated. Yeah, but Sharon, how about if we just go towards the end of the comment, which you basically say, I think conservatives say whatever they want us to think, but it's really an excuse for their actions. This isn't true. Conservatives aren't conservatives either. Conservatives are partisans who seek win-lose consequences. So like they win and you lose. Is could uh, do you want to make a further comment? Uh, on that? I would like to make a further comment. Okay. From the time that uh, Nixon was in, I was thinking that we would lose our freedom as we knew it if he was in another four years. Mm -hmm. uh, and since then, I have always thought they would seek power at any cost because they think they know things and we don't. Uh, that they're superior. And um, to me, uh, it is a partisan attitude of which, oh, they used words like mobocracy, things like that, if we had a vote. And uh, 
I feel that that's still true. We just notice it more with Nick uh, Trump, mm -hmm. but it's always been true. And Bush, uh, the second Bush, um, the first Bush, I felt, I told my son that, um, oh, I always forget his name, who became okay. president, who was running against the first Bush. Mm -hmm. And I told my son that he would be shot, but not killed by a Bush supporter. Uh, and my son says, why did you know that? Well, I thought they needed a, a uh, martyr to get their agenda through. And um, well, that president that I can't remember the name of, um, who was, um, anyways, he had been a Democrat, but he did put Bush as a, uh, a vice president. So he wasn't that mad at him. And uh, well, there's different things that happened at that time, like um, the helicopters that couldn't even get off the ground to try to to uh, rescue the uh, Iran. That Bush was ahead of the FBI or SCIA, I think, uh, at that time or something. Yeah, but right. they said that it was our uh, Carter who had leaked the problem so that those helicopters couldn't fly. Sharon, well, that's Sharon, silly. Sharon, Sharon anyway, yeah, that's you close your closing comment because we're, we're trying to keep it to, to, to no more than two, about two minutes. Okay, so mm -hmm. I loved what she said prior to me. Thank I love that she mentioned that particular statement. Good, very good. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, let's see. Um, I think Kathy has a, yes, Kathy has a comment. Kathy Humble. Hi, I wanted to talk about decentralized pluralism. And um, I, I favor decentralized pluralism. I like some of the ideas there, uh, especially given what I see of the federal government lately. But you have to be careful what you're looking at. How are you defining your terms in terms of the local uh, tribes involved? And when are you defining them? I use the Bay Area as an example. Um, you have in the Bay Area, you've got the flavor of San Francisco, you have the flavor of Berkeley, a totally different flavor in Oakland. You ha even have, I've learned about through my daughter-in-law, a Burmese American flavor uh, in the Southeast part of the Bay. Uh, so where do you cut it? And who gets to control what? Uh, when BART, Bay Area Rapid Transit first started out, there was one county in the peninsula that wouldn't vote it in. And I think it was San Mateo County, but I could be wrong. It was north of Santa Clara. And because they were blocking the path of BART for a while, that was a big roadblock. So you had to the north, you had counties that supported it. To the south, you had counties that supported it. And in between, you had this, this decentralized plural area that uh, was again it. Finally, BART went through, and BART has been one of the most crucial things in linking all these disparate cultures, dis disparate communities within the Bay Area. It would be a very different situation without BART, uh, as much as the difference between the Golden Gate Bridge before and after 1938. Um, secondly, when do, you, when do you look at the tribes? When, when do you define the tribes? For example, uh, Santa Clara County in uh, the 60s was apricot orchards. It's now uh, Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Those are two very different cultures, two different, very different groups of people, mm -hmm. two very different sets of needs and interests and uh, political approaches. So how do you keep track of an ever sliding, changing uh, pattern of who's where, when? Mm -hmm. So true. Thank you, Kathy. It was very, very well put. Uh, Sue Pierce um, had a comment uh, in pertaining to Jill, Jill's comment about her answer to a friend who considered voting for Trump to preserve democracy. And she says, uh, Sue says, I fear a vote for Trump will lead to a totalitarian government resulting in a far greater loss of democracy, democratic government. 
um, that we, uh, by voting for Trump. Okay, uh, Frank, uh, Hank Robb had a, um, had a comment, please. Come on in, Hank. So I'll, uh, the example of the county in um, um, uh, the Bay Area, I'm not sure will count for Brooks as how the left is is ruining things. <laughs> I think I think what he would count <clears throat> are things like uh, stopping nuclear power plants, uh, being able a small, a relatively small group of people being able to change the entire trajectory of how we're going to power the country. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly here locally, the whole controversy over the spotted owl and the implications for um, uh, the wood products industry. So I think if you, if, you begin th if you begin thinking about things like that, then you will see how, again, as Margaret Mead said, you know, it's a small group of people who are always the troublemakers. And, and in some way, I mean, you can swing that both ways. Uh, but, but my point is, if you begin thinking about things like that, I think that's what Brooks is talking about. And he is just as much talking about people like Thurgood Marshall, who ruin everything in the 50s by saying <laughs> schools have to be integrated. integrated. Everything was fine until this little troublemaking organization shows up and gets the Supreme Court to ruin everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, look for examples like that, and then I think you will understand what Brooks is talking about. I, I would like to say just one more thing. Sure, you got time. And that is, it, it relates to the, uh, the opening uh, 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 that, that you made. I'm looking right at you. <laughs> uh, the opening statement. And, mm -hmm. and that is, if you, if you take the time to go back, you will find that Benito Mussolini actually had a philosopher, a real academic philosopher, who put forward his theory of fascism. And the theory was that religion is dead. People cannot take religion seriously anymore, but they need something to organize their lives around. And he proposed the state. So this idea of organizing your life around work is really an extension, I would say, of the conviction that religion as an organizing principle for people is simply not working anymore and people are looking elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Hank. Uh, Michael, you had a comment. Mike, Mike. Right here. Yes. Okay, um, and that was in uh, response to, I forget who said it, that America lost its uh, innocence or yes. during the Watergate thing. Ooh, well, ooh. Yeah, but, you know, we never really had much innocence to begin with. I don't <laughs> and, um, yeah, I'm trying to look at what I read because I'm writing this while I'm listening to everybody else. So, um, yeah, there's so much. You know, I'm, I still go on Facebook a lot, um, but I think, you know, there's so much people out there trying to get attention by being the most outrageous person they can possibly be. Um, and it's, you know, it's just like, instead of courting outrage at everything, I mean, I get outraged a lot, but, you know, I feel uncomfortable being guided by it. Uh, I think we should look at our what we really need in our lives, what's missing, you know, what could be improved, and you know, you know, find common ground with other people in the so-called tribes, because tribes can thrive a lot better without having to expend unnecessary time and energy fighting each other when they can co collaborate, admit there's differences between members of that tribe. But, you know, if there are workable differences, you know, what's all the fighting about? Right, right. Thank you, Michael. Um, David Gray, you had your hand, uh, go ahead. I'm seeing, you may not know how to get into the chat. David Gray, do you wanna, I see you're yeah. trying to make a comment. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. I do have a comment or two, but first, um, I, you, some of you uh, local people may have noticed a couple with the name of Michael Gora. Uh, they're, Gina and Mike are friends of Joan oh. and mine going way, 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 way back to our Atlanta days. It's, it's great to see you two. And if you have a comment, do it. Yeah. Okay. Well, my um, comment. I'm so glad you're uh, here. Uh, Hank Robb brought up the philosopher of Mussolini saying that uh, religion won't work so people need a, a, I use the term belief system. We all need a belief system. It doesn't always mean that our belief system is completely rational. Well, we uh, hope it is. Um, and I keep thinking in terms of uh, the urge to compete, which uh, Joyce sent out a list of comments, which she says, um, it does Darwinian thinking that all optimism, globalization and so forth. So anyway, so she's talking about the urge to compete, the urge to win, but the very important frequently used term in the uh, in Brooks' piece, social trust. That's part of our species also. The urge to compete, the urge to win versus social trust. Those two urges are built into our species. And unless somebody does genetic engineering on our species to reduce the urge to compete, the urge to win, then that's not gonna change. It'll always be a difficult balance between the urge to win and compete versus social trust because we are a social species. Mm -hmm. So we, and one, just one last thought that keeps occurring to me. Yes, if You're you okay. follow the news, obviously there's a horrible decrease, breakdown of social trust. But in my own personal experiences, I'm not experiencing that at all. If I go to uh, our Fred Meyer supermarket or a restaurant, everybody is quite reasonable and friendly and helpful. So I'm wondering how many other people are comparing their own personal experiences with, um, with, the, with the big picture. Mm -hmm. That's Thank all. You, Thank you. Uh, Mel, you had a you had a comment. Can well, I certainly uh, you know found this uh, article to be uh, both interesting, <clears throat> stimulating. I think it's uh, unfortunate for me and maybe others that uh, I really don't avail myself of uh, articles such as this uh, as frequently as I ought to. And I can say with some assurance that there are any number of people more so uh, completely uninterested in. Uh, reading articles such as this or expanding their notion of uh, what there is to be discussed in a civic environment. But to the point of the article itself, I think that uh, I like the way Brooks is analyzing the notion of moral convulsion, whatever it may be, uh, by uh, basically focusing on the extent to which trust is dissipated and replaced by or caused that dissipation caused by distrust mm -hmm. that occurs in these various uh, points in time that he is referring to. And I think our major, uh, our major uh, uh, challenge is to somehow dissipate distrust. And as a consequence thereof, we will necessarily increase trust in my simplistic view of this being a zero sum trust game, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, I don't think we're gonna go anywhere as a society uh, unless we can be more trustful mm -hmm. and we can't get there without dissipating the distrust. And I can agree with all of us who've said that the first step in dissipating distrust is getting him out of that office. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, at the same token, I would suggest that some people look to what's been said in connection with analyzing what's happened in the past. And I, I think it's remarkable yeah. how anytime 
we go back to the 60s in our conversation, and maybe I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. I'm going to say without exception, we have focused on the Vietnam War yeah. and the extent to which it has generated so much distrust. No one, to my recollection, has mentioned that that was the time we were able to come together and enact the Voting Rights Act. And I'd like to say that if we can look to examples of trust, maybe we can see ways where we can repeat those instances where we have been able to, what people say, cross the aisle or whatever. And they, we, can, we, can, we can overcome examples of distrust mm -hmm. and move forward, you know, the way a lot of us would like to, including Brooks in his essay. And Johnson knew he was good. The Democratic Party was going to lose the South when they passed when he passed that legislation, and it's proven true. And uh, he and was he was a very brave man. He was a, a troubled man. Very, he was a very brave worked, man. He worked very hard to to have it happen, despite mm -hmm. the political challenge that faced him. Thank you. That was thank you for adding that. Joyce, uh, you have a comment. Uh, well, I just wanted to respond first to what uh, Mel just said. Mm -hmm. Doris Kearns Goodwin's most recent book on leadership uses uh, President Johnson as one of her four great presidents. And she did that even though she saw Vietnam as his biggest failing. But that he didn't handle that well, but what he did was pass a great deal of progressive legislation. So I just wanted to make that comment about Johnson. But I also wanted to mention that uh, when we were talking about the way the left has gone overboard, John, my spouse right here, just made the comment that um, the Me Too was a movement that went overboard. A lot of people were accused falsely and that sort of thing. So there was, it's hard to know where the right balance is with that, that sort of thing. And I, and I did wanna say to um, Hank regarding moral certainty, if we can't get our moral certainty from religion, how much of it, and he, he said people can turn to the state, not that he wasn't recommending that, but people turn to the state. So does that mean that we have to legislate our moral certainty? We certainly have laws against murder and robbery and uh, certain ways you can drive and that sort of thing. So where do we legislate it and where do we just agree with each other that this is a moral stance that our society wants to live by? Um, I'm going to let Hank, because he was challenged here, I'm going to let him, uh, he's, he, he wants to respond. Go ahead. Um, go ahead, Rod, Hank. Um, I think if I understand Brooks correctly and what he's trying to talk about, I, I don't think he's trying to talk about a, a whole lot more than if we don't agree with each other that uh, we're not going to lie uh, we're not going to fudge the facts. If we can't do things like that, then we can't cooperate. And, and that, that seems completely reasonable to me. I mean, I, I think as humanists, this whole idea of moral certainty, that's the very thing that's out the window. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it, just to speak to this uh, philosopher, of, of philosopher of fascism, um, his idea was, I mean, if I understand correctly, he is the author of this word totalitarianism because the idea was people want something that they can totally give themselves to. Mm -hmm. And this was the reason it was important for Italy to go to war with somebody someplace because in war, people are prepared to totally give themselves to something and the idea is, you, you know, you need to keep finding places to go to war because that's how people can totally give themselves. Um, it, 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 it really is not, um, uh, it is about, it, it is trying to address that kind of, of issue that the, the longing for um, uh, sort of the opposite of, of, of what humanism comes to, which is we're all stuck with uncertainty. We need to learn to live with it as opposed to we've got to find something so we can make it go away. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Thank you, Hank. Thank if, you. If I ever get a chance to get back in, I, I do have something I want to say about uh, Keep going. centralized plural, pluralism, but but I don't want to take too okay. much. Time Just put your name, put your name back in. We'll see if we got time. Okay. Uh, Jill, you had Jill, you had a comment about um, social trust being developed by the next generation in a much different way than before with the online community. Right, and and what I've seen with with young people and the games that they are either developing or playing that others have developed is a more collaborative type of environment where they you know, they create their avatar, they imbue them with certain personality traits or social traits, and they are able then to um, accomplish tasks that they want to as a group rather than um, individual and, and rather than competitive. But what we've also seen is that is in, like in Kenosha, where the young kid, you know, was shooting people up, that also is indicative of, um, of video games yeah. that are war-based. And so it's almost like the this next generation has taken this, um, taken our society and um, furthered it in, uh, in an online presence. And I think that the ones who are doing it for the collective good, building societies, I mean, they have games that they actually build societies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, if they can continue to do that, and continue to um, get in groups that, that do that, it really does help them in the long run then in dealing with reality. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Al, you had a comment. Yeah, I just wanna throw in something pretty quickly here. You know, we somebody said that, oh, changing the presidency is the best way to, to changing the occupant of the White House is the best way to restore trust. I, I'll take the broad view instead. And I think the two, the two really bad attributes of our current society that contribute to this lack of trust are one, the idea that, oh, if, if there's something you don't like, but it's not illegal, then it really wasn't wrong. So you can't complain about it. And you know, that legality is, is the borderline now of acceptable behavior. And the idea that we can't have anything stronger than that, that that constrains people in any way is, 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 is a little bit is, is a little bit problematic. And the other thing is that telling part of the truth in a misleading way is not lying. Therefore, it's not really wrong. Uh, we had this in the debates where Trump said, well, I prepaid my taxes. Not only did I pay my taxes, I prepaid them. Yeah, and, he, and then he came up with, with deductions and credits, so we got all his money back, but it, part of the truth, part of the truth. Okay. We're going to, uh, Hank is going to come back on to, to make a comment about decentralized pluralism, and then we're going to uh, see the video that, uh, to, to close out. So Hank, can you unmute and make a, 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 a comment on pluralism, pluralism, and then we'll start the movie. Well, I, I sort of hate to make this comment and then we're going to start a movie and no one will have a chance to respond, but I will do it anyway with apologies for that fact. <laughs> okay. um, I think that when uh, Brooks is talking about decentralized pluralism, all he's doing is bringing to the fore once again, the idea of states' rights. And, and I will, this is the very controversial part. Mm -hmm. I think our, our understanding of our own history is, is completely wrong about the Civil War. People understand the Civil War to have been about slavery. I don't think that's right at all. I think it was the view of some states that what they had done with federalism with, was what the European states did with the European Union and that members of that union could leave just as Britain has in fact left. Mm -hmm. And now the reason they wanted to leave, I grant you, is, uh, was uh, over slavery. But if, if we had taken seriously that we are not independent states, we are not states, we are simply provinces of one country 
we would have gotten rid of things like the Electoral College. They don't make any sense anymore because that was to represent independent states, which the Civil War put an end to. Okay, thank you. And that could be our next discussion, buddy. I mean, this I think this has gone so well. If anybody wanted to respond to um, Hank's comment. I will. We, okay, Gail, go ahead, go for it. Uh, Sounds like Hank was educated in the South about states' rights. <laughs> There's a Confederate general who said, if the Civil War wasn't about slavery, I don't know what it was about. And if you look back, I back, went back and looked at the newspaper articles around the time the Civil War started, and they were all about forcing that the South was upset that, the, the nor that they could not enforce on the Northern states the, the obligation under the Fugitive Slave Act to return fugitive slaves. That, that they were losing their slaves and the North wasn't giving them back. And uh, this was their, this, you know, the state's right to, to have slavery was important, but the right of the Northern states to not enforce the Fugitive state Slave Act was, 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 not, was not considered. So I think the consensus really is that it was about slavery. Okay, As all of us know, life is filled with peaks and valleys. Tonight, David Brooks diverges from politics to share a personal journey marked by loneliness and sparked by the inspiration of others who have overcome life-altering obstacles. That's the subject of David's latest book, and it's the newest addition to our bookshelf, The Second Mountain, The Quest for a Moral Life. David Brooks, you've written another book, The Second Mountain, The Quest for for a moral life. And what you do here is you say the life that many of us are leading is, is a life that's self-centered, uh, that this is a moment of transition in our society. What's wrong with what we're doing right now? Yeah, there's a book about moral renewal, how individuals and societies turn themselves around. And it starts with the idea that we've slipped into some bad values. We're too individualistic when we should be a little more communal. We're too cognitive up in our head and analytical when we should be more emotional and relational. We steer our kids toward career success and not toward moral joy. And when you have bad values, you steer, you end up in a bad place. And that happened to me personally five or six years ago, which was really at the start of this book. But I found people who, who realized the core truth, you can't solve your problems on the level of consciousness at which you created them. They went deeper into themselves and they discovered a level of ability for care. Uh, and they lead marvelous lives. How did you know that this new kind of living, the second mountain, as you describe it, is, is the answer? Yeah. How did that come to you? I went through a bad period in 2013. My kids were gone away to college or going. My marriage had ended. I, a lot of my friendships were in the conservative movement, um, but I was not that kind of conservative anymore, so a lot of my friendships went away. Uh, and so I was living alone in an apartment um, and I had valued time over people. I had valued productivity or relationship. So I didn't have a lot of weekend friends. I had workday friends that were professional, but not weekend friends. And I had vast stretches of loneliness. Uh, if you went to my drawers, uh, where you, there used to be, where there should have been silverware in the kitchen, I had post-it notes. Where there should have been plates, uh, I had stationery. Because I was just working. I was using workaholism as therapy for an emotional and spiritual problem. So I was down in, in the valley. Uh, and I went through that period, and I discovered you can either be broken or you can be broken open. And some people get broken, they turn fearful in their bad moments, and they lash out. They turn hostile and vi violent and tribal and are filled with resentments. But some people get broken open. You just realize the depths of yourself. And you realize that only spiritual and, and emotional food is going to fill those depths. So you think, i got to change my worldview. So I spent five years looking at people who've done it and trying to learn from them. You have a number of observations in here. One of them that struck me, our society has become a conspiracy against joy. One of the things I really discovered in the course of this process was that it's useful to make a distinction between happiness and joy. We spend a lot of time thinking about happiness. And happiness is when you win your victory, when something goes well, you get a promotion. And happiness is an expansion of self. But joy is when the self disappears, when you transcend yourself. Uh, there's a woman in the book who I interviewed in Ohio who the worst thing happened to her that could happen to her. She came home one Sunday and her husband had killed their kids and himself. Uh, and now she leads a life of pure service, pure gift. She has a free pharmacy. She teaches at Ohio University. She helps women who've suffered violence. And she said, I did it partly out of anger. I wanted to show whatever that guy tried to do to me. He 
didn't do it. I was going to make a difference in the world. And so there's anger there, but there's also the joy of self-giving. So is this a prescription that for everybody? Does it work for people who are struggling just to get by? Yeah, I think it works for everybody. I've been with rich people and poor people, uh, and everybody needs spiritual growth. Everybody has a soul. It gives us infinite value and dignity. And what the soul does is it yearns for righteousness. I mean, in our business, we cover a lot of bad people in wars, crime, uh, genocide. I've never met anybody who didn't want to be good. And I didn't, never met anybody whose life didn't fall apart if they thought they were leading a bad and meaningless life. And so on that level of soul, we all, we all need to feed, feed the yearning to be good, to try to be a good person. How do you relate all this to what's going on in our country right now, in our politics? How does it connect to that? Yeah, I think at, at bottom, the, the Trump moment is a spiritual and moral crisis. We just treat each other badly. Uh, we're not compassionate towards one another. We're, we stereotype rather than see the dignity of each human person. And I think it flows out of loneliness and disconnection. A lot of people who voted for him, their, their communities are falling apart. And they needed something new. And then we're in a tribal warfare where we don't communicate with each other well. We don't see deeply into each other's souls. We don't befriend one another. And so we get this volleys of hatred. And so to me, our problems are, we have political problems, we have economic problems, but we also have spiritual and moral problems. And we've become not great about talking about them because it always seems like, oh, you're the problem. We don't live, live for relationship and that, that's the change that has to happen. Are there others out there pushing these ideas? Is this, is this part of a greater movement or is it, is it how do you describe it? I quizzically wear this little pin on my lapel occasionally from time to time on the news hour. I started something called at the Aspen's called Weave, the Social Fabric Project. And I meet weavers wherever you go. And these are people who are weaving relationship. They're weaving community. I met a woman named Lisa Fitzpatrick in New Orleans. She was driving. She turned and saw a, two, ten, a 10 and 11 year old boy looking terrified. The boys held up a gun and they shot her in the face. And it was their gang initiation thing. And she said, I wasn't the victim and they weren't the victims. We were trapped in this war that started long before us. So she gave herself and she quit her job as a healthcare executive. She works with gang members. She works with community members. And now she too has one of these second families where kids just show up at her home. They knock on the door. There are a bunch of 40, 17 year olds hanging around this 55 year old woman. And she says, why are you hanging around with me? And she says, because we, we knocked on the door, you opened it. And so that, that longing for community, these weavers are leading us into a better future. My basic theory of social change is that culture changes when a small group of people find a better way to live and the rest of us copy them. And these weavers have found a better way to live. And I wear this to celebrate them and to illuminate them and hope they can lead us to a better future. Well, the book is uh, definitely worth reading. It's worth talking about, uh, reflecting on uh, the second mountain, the quest for a moral life, looking for a better way. David Brooks, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I wanted to thank everybody for coming uh, today and for uh, our first Zoom discussion. Uh, Del, thank and she, and Susan, thank you so much for bringing this article forward. It really got us talking and thinking and. Uh, I loved it. I just thought it was great.